many times we've heard that foreigners cannot travel to Xinjiang, they cannot move around freely in Xinjiang. If they go, they will be followed, chased, or frequently checked by local authorities. But was it really the case? A few years ago, I actually interviewed an Australian British. His name is Jerry Gray, who traveled extensively several times in different years across Xinjiang. He said he never experienced any of those. And today I have another guest. He is a Muslim coming from Pakistan. He will share with us his journey because he traveled extensively across Xinjiang as well. He will share with us what he saw in Xinjiang as a Muslim. So my guest today, his name is Harood. He's a Pakistani who is studying at Tsinghua University now. So Harood, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. So I heard actually you traveled all across China, including Xinjiang before. So can you tell us more about your trip? Yeah, so the destination was actually Pakistan. So it was in 2018, uh, summer vacations, June and July, when I left from Beijing to Pakistan, the capital Islamabad, because that's where I'm from. And uh, the major part was through Xinjiang. So I went all the way from Beijing to Inner Mongolia to Gansu, and then in Xinjiang, where I spent almost 10 days. And then I crossed the borders at Kashi. And then I went into Pakistan. Yep. So, so all the major you... cities that, that, that you can say in Xinjiang, like starting from Hami, uh, mm -hmm. Ulumuchi, Tulufan, Kashi, and all those cities. Yep. You've been, well, been to a lot of cities. So you were on your motorbike, uh, rode your way all the way from Beijing to Pakistan. Yeah, exactly. It was around 6,000 kilometers and we spent almost 28 days on road. Mm. You, you've been to so many cities in, in Xinjiang, but um, for example, we've read so many reports from several international medias because they keep saying reporters, foreigners kept getting get followed. Uh, they keep saying foreigners got followed by local police, by local people to check their IDs, check their information, stopping them from going to certain places. So it's just a lot of uh, stopping. I'm wondering, you, you as a foreigner who'd been to so many cities in Xinjiang, uh, at any point were you being stopped by local officials, by local people, um, any kind of stopping you from doing anything? So to be very true, there was lots of security, but no one ever stopped us specifically. Uh, when you are traveling by road, it's for sure that you're going to go through a lot of security, uh, security check posts, uh, mm -hmm. through tool plazas or tool checkpoints or anywhere. So yeah, we crossed lots of security checkpoints. We crossed lots of tool plazas. Uh, we made entries uh, at, at security check posts. Maybe they would ask for our bike documents, our driving license. That's very common, I think. So wherever you travel, and yeah, that was pretty much the case. No one ever stopped or followed us anywhere. And we had very prominent cameras all our, on our helmets. Anyone can see that we have cameras and we are recording everything. No one ever so stopped you, us, no one. You've been f filming the entire time with your trip from like all those Hami to Kashgar to Turpan to, to Urumqi. You've been filming all the time and police were not stopping you? Uh, it's not obviously all the time because that would be too much of data. So whenever we had like specific points, we all we can start it like on just a go. We started mm -hmm. recording. We recorded many of the parts, you know, even like the through security checkpoints as well. Like I'm not sure if the if the if the policeman knew that we are recording, but we did record that part as well. So <laughs> so like no one can say that we are just saying it by ourselves. Like yeah, they didn't stop you or ask you hey what are you filming and ask you to delete all those footage no no one ever checked our phones no one ever checked our cameras like we were never checked like we we had big bags on our like bikes and no one ever asked that open your bags what's what is inside there mm. no one nothing nothing like that not at all interesting because that sounds very different from many reports on several major international media. Due to reading those reports, I thought maybe foreigners will face more like stricter rules to go certain places, do certain things, but you never had that experience? I think so. If you have a good mindset, uh, a good uh, will, then you will uh, be like 
getting the goodwill of the locals as well. So I think so for us, we had a very good will. We just wanted to travel. We just wanted to explore. Just the way you mentioned that, whatever you see on the on the Western media. So I think so that was my mindset before going to Xinjiang because it was my first time going to Xinjiang. So I had no idea what Xinjiang is. Whatever I knew was from the Western media, whatever is on internet, that's what I knew. So I had a lots of uh, different kind of ideas and uh, and background in my mind. But when I was there, you know, I got it completely different. It was not like that, that we have been listening on the media and in the news all the time. And um, uh, what I would say is that uh, when back in 2010 or 2013 or 2012, when, when there was the unrest or all those terrorist activities, uh, where were all these, these Western medias? Like why were they're not speaking out. Why it's right now when they are speaking, when they face that China is gonna replace them as the first, as the largest economy. Why is it right now? So it makes it makes a good sense that why it is <laughs> uh, like anyone. Can, yeah, I think so anyone can understand that they feel a sense of security. So mm. they just want to maybe just just bully in some way or the other. Uh, why don't they talk about Palestine? And those Muslims in Palestine, why they don't talk about Kashmir? And those Muslims in Kashmir, like there are evidence, there are videos what's going on in Palestine and in Kashmir. Like there are jet planes, there are fighter jets, there are bombings, there are shelling, it's gunfire. That's what the open prison is. People are dying over there. And no one talks about that. But what they want to talk about is the Xinjiang. And yeah, they should talk about. And what they should talk about is the, is the growth that Xinjiang has has like the development that Xinjiang has has been through this 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 period, and uh, that's what I saw with my eyes. That's what I recorded with my cameras, and uh, that's what I experienced through my my stay in Xinjiang. All these days that I I met with these locals, talked with these people. Uh, that's um, uh, also uh, also like the the focus of like the Chinese government. If you if you see BRI, it's a very very big project. Uh, but if you see the 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 land connections, Xinjiang is the, is, is one of the center of it. Urumqi, the capital of the Xinjiang province, it's going to be the mm. hub of of these all land connections. If you talk about the the China Pakistan economic corridor, or if you talk about the connections that's going to go through Kazakhstan all the way to the to the Europe and to the Central Asia, uh, Asian countries, Urumqi going to be the center of all of it. So. Why, like, I would like to say, where were all these Western medias when the, uh, when the people over there had that standard of living and now this new standard of living where they can enjoy all these necessities, good internet and all the safety and everything. Why don't mm -hmm. they, 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 they portray that, that image? <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. And also, um, when you were in Xinjiang, did you have any interactions with the local people? For example, uh, you're Muslim. Did you interact with the Muslim community living in Xinjiang? Yeah, for sure. I'm Muslim. I come from Pakistan. More than 95% population in Pakistan is Muslim. And mm -hmm. uh, I did I did have uh, lots of communication, uh, lots of interaction with the local Muslims as well, with the local community as well. Uh, I went to quite a few mosques as well, uh, which were open. Uh, there were prayers going on. And uh, I did pray in the mosque in Xinjiang. Uh, I would like to mention an interesting story as well. I was in Xinjiang and we went to a mosque and it's very common back in Pakistan that travelers can stay overnight in mosques. So mm -hmm. I never knew that it can happen in Xinjiang and it was all because of that media that, that says those stories. So we prayed in the mosque and it was night and my friend was like, why don't we try and just stay here? Because we were camping all, all over this trip. So he, mm -hmm. was, he was like kind of a bit tired. So he was like, maybe it would be more comfortable if we stay here. So we talked to the Imam and uh, we were the only two foreigners over there. Uh, we had a very good communication, very good interaction with the Imam. And uh, we asked that, can you stay overnight here? And he was very happy. He was like, yeah, why not for sure. We stayed there overnight. The next morning, we had a very good shower over there because in camp, you can't shower. <laughs> so we, <laughs> the next morning, we shower. Uh, we had a very good meal with them. And then we left. It was all okay. You actually said before you went there, you actually also didn't know what would happen, whether it's possible to do in Xinjiang because of the stories you read from 
from the internet, from a Western、um, media or whatever. But when you actually have those experience in 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 Xinjiang, I wonder、um, what's your whole view about Xinjiang after this trip? Well, the whole view to me of Xinjiang is very different from what I had before going to Xinjiang. And、uh, before going to Xinjiang, for sure, I was a bit concerned. I was, my family was、uh, concerned as well. That why you want to do this? One one main reason was obviously the motorbike. The other reasons were all the media and the the, the stories that are you see that that you see in the internet.、Uh, but once I was there, it was totally different because whenever I say about this, that I traveled on bike from Beijing to Islamabad, and I travel all through Xinjiang and I experienced by myself. The most common questions are that where did you stay for this this almost one month? And、uh, you know, obviously we were staying in camps because we were just students, and we also wanted to have more adventure because you can't find hotels everywhere, but you can camp everywhere. So we were camping, and、uh, whenever I say that we were camping all these days, the very second question is that weren't、uh, you afraid? Is it all safe? Where did you camp? And I was like, where you can imagine I camped there, and I camped everywhere, literally. And、uh, I was never concerned about the safety. In the in result, Xinjiang or also, also in in the whole China? You mean you are not concerned? You are you are camping everywhere and it's feel very safe in Xinjiang. Everywhere、mm. in Xinjiang, all over China, including all these twenty eight days, all those ten days in Xinjiang, and、uh, I was camping everywhere because、uh, we didn't have a proper plan that we're gonna start today here, stop today here. The next day we're gonna stop there. We didn't have that kind of plan. So whenever, wherever we reached, we we felt that we are tired. We just stopped there. We camp and we stayed there. So it was very safe all all the time. And this safety is actually the result of all the security which is there in Xinjiang. If there is not the security, then then what was happening before, like eight nine years ago, that would be happening. I won't be camping. I won't be traveling on on the bike to Xinjiang. And、uh, One one is the safety. The second one is the is the happiness of local people. I would say because of all the development projects, especially after the start of BRI,、uh, there are lots of development projects going on、uh, all over Xinjiang. So obviously, locals have better job opportunities. They can earn good money, and they can have a good standard of living. So obviously, they are happy. They are happy with the Chinese government.、Uh, Similarly,、uh, the other infrastructure that would that you would like to say, for example,、uh, the newly constructed uh, uh, highway all across from Beijing to to Romuchi.、Uh, similarly, the high speed railings from Lanzhou to Romuchi, and inside uh, inside uh, uh, Xinjiang as well, all the railings.、Uh, similarly, the internet connection is so good. Like、uh, wherever we were. So、uh, we had very good internet connection, internet connection all the time. It we had 4G connections.、Uh, we can talk back home anytime, anywhere, and share all the beautiful views that we had in front of our eyes.、Uh, usually, you don't have this kind of uh, uh, luxury uh, in other places. If you are in in mountains, if you are in those valleys, maybe the internet connection is not that stable, and you have to wait to get back home and then share. But that was not the case. So, so these are all good things, that, and it's the result of all the efforts which have been done by Chinese government.、Mm-hmm. As we mentioned earlier, the security control in Xinjiang is definitely much higher than than elsewhere, than other cities in China. I remember when I went there in 2014. At some point, I was about to get very angry at the security guy who asked me constantly, asked me to open my ba- bags, and like was like, "This is so annoying. Well, how many times do I need to open my bags to prove that I don't have bombs?" So, I kind of it's really annoying. But I also kind of try to tell myself, calm down. They are there for a reason. But like, and then that became an issue for I think for a lot of foreigners or or reporters who come to Xinjiang. That is security control. So that means Xinjiang is a is a police state. They monitor everyone who's doing evil things. So they try to use that against Xinjiang. So I'm wondering, does that heavy security control bothers you? And、um, how do you see this heavy security control in Xinjiang? Well, I would say what's wrong in in monitoring the evil people is nothing wrong. They should be monitored. Evil should be monitored, and、uh, 
and all about those foreigners who are actually monitored and are chased by the security uh, security agencies. I think so. There is a reason behind that, and the reason is the way they portray the image, the way they use those those videos and those images, uh, because. Uh, for example, if there is a glass of water, you can see it half full. You can, at the same time, you can see it half empty. So it's the way how you portray it, uh, and that's the issue with these uh, these this, this media houses and with these people who are being judged, and because they can only see it half empty. So obviously, they have to be monitored. They have to be checked that what you want to do, what you are doing over there, and apart from that. If there is uh, a security complex, not in US, in Afghanistan, for example, US and NATO troops were there. There are there were many security complex. If a media team wants to go there, would they allow them to go there? Obviously, they won't allow them. So same is the case back in Xinjiang as well. Mm, there are security agencies and there are those security checkpoints. Those who are doing their own job. Uh, and I think so anywhere in the world, if you go through security checkpoints, they won't allow you to record it. And it's the same case back in Xinjiang as well. I think so it's nothing abnormal. And when I was through there, uh, as I already mentioned, I was never asked to open my bags. No one ever asked me to open my bags. And to be very, very true, and a very interesting fact was uh, like the big cities, all over China, not only in Xinjiang, they actually don't allow motorbikes in the city area because of the accidents issues. And uh, same was in, in Xinjiang. I was in Urumqi. So Urumqi does not allow motorbikes. My bike plate is from Beijing because I started from Beijing. And I was with my friend, we were riding in Urumqi on our bikes. We, we had big bags at our bikes. No one ever stopped us. And our bike, my bike was having some issues with its chain. So I wanted to find a repair shop. So I asked many locals that, is there any repair shop around here? And I, I was not able to find. So I was just going through and I saw a traffic police guy standing right next to the, to the traffic signal. So I just stopped next to him. Actually, at that point, I didn't know that I am illegally riding in the city area. I stopped by him and I asked that, I'm looking for a repair shop because my bike is having issues. So is there any repair shop here? And he was like, oh, no, there are no repair shops because motorbikes are not allowed in the city. He was so calm. He just said it like this to me. He, he was like, there are no repair shops because motorbikes are not allowed in the city. And the next thing that he said was, uh, will the electric bike shop work? Like, I was so surprised that uh, <laughs> uh, I think so the normal reaction would be like, after he said that motorbikes are not allowed, he may ask for my documents that where is your license? Where is your bike documents? But what he said was still helping me. And he asked that, will the electric bike shop work? Maybe you can find an electric bike shop because there are quite a few here and you can repair it there. And I was like, no, it, it's not gonna work. And he was like, it's okay, travel safe. And that's all I left. So <laughs> it, was, it was really good. Like they were very welcome. They were, they were very good to us. Mm hmm. Interesting. People were friendly and you went there in 2018. And I think that was among the period that uh, many international reporters were saying things were, got, were getting harder and stricter were getting horrible. But actually, even during that time, you were still and you could easily be misunderstood as a Uyghur. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's and, another point. Like, uh, with the friend that I had with me, he, he looks more like a Uyghur, like the local. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, his eyes color is different. It's, uh, he, he, he looks a full Uyghur Muslim. And, <laughs> and uh, whenever we, like we had no issues even that. Uh, like the foreigners, they are very uh, different. With one look, you can see that they are not locals and they are foreigners. But for us, we, we were very like, from our appearance, locals. we were like, very like mm -hmm. uh, Uyghurs. But we still had no issues. And was it really true that people in Pakistan, like Chinese people and Pakistanis in Pakistan, really were living friendly, having a good relationship in Pakistan? Yeah, that's very really true. I've been, obviously, me being Pakistani, I've stayed most of my time back in Pakistan. And I've been in China for, for almost three, three years as well. So, yeah, Chinese are very welcomed back in Pakistan. And the reason is, is, 
is all of this disconnection, all of this friendship. Uh, it's very common to see local shop owners, local shop owners not asking for money from Chinese tourists back in Pakistan. It's very common to see uh, the the tool plazas or tool uh, tool checkpoints not asking for the for the toll uh, from the Chinese tourists, those who are traveling on the highways. It's very common sight. You can even have a lot, there are lots of videos. Like it's not me saying this. It's the Chinese tourists mm -hmm. who make these videos with all the invention of these me, these social apps like TikTok or all this. You can have these videos anywhere. And uh, similarly, uh, the the locals offering food on on, on streets, locals uh, helping Chinese. It, it's a very common sight. Yeah, Chinese are welcomed back in Pakistan, and same uh, same is for us. We are. Whenever we are outside, if a local Chinese gets to know that I am from Pakistan, the very first word that I get to know is the path here or the laut here. And oh. if you can <laughs> understand Chinese, you would know what, what, what path here means. Tia is the steel and pa is from Pakistan. So it's like steel, mm -hmm. steel friends, that, that kind of friendship. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, coming from Pakistan, I think you are also no stranger to the effect of terrorism. So that's why part of the reason why China, uh, why Xinjiang was uh, taking all these measures and campaigns to fight terrorism. But interesting, none of those terrorism attacks were being mentioned by those media who say they care about Muslims. Um, it, I think it's very funny to me. And a few years ago, when there was still unrest, uh, there was still rioting happening that uh, led to a lot of local people, including Han people and the Uyghurs, uh, died in those terror attacks. Those media like BBC or other Western media, they were covering those events. And they were kind of cheering about this uh, terrorism was happening in China because that created some kind of unrest. But now they suddenly changed their tone and used to just suddenly care about the Muslims. I would, I would like to invite those media outlets to come now to Xinjiang and, uh, and, uh, and talk about what's going on in Xinjiang, about the BRI projects, about the development, about the happiness of the people which is going on. But they just don't want to talk about that because they won't have the ratings in their media outlets. They won't have the backings from the government, from their, from their government, from their, uh, from their politicians, because that's not what they want, because it's just the, the hypocrisy, it's just the diplomacy, that's what they want. Iraq war, no one ever can explain what happened in Iraq. There were no chemical weapons found out by these, these, these allied forces, found out by these US forces in Iraq. It's a complete unrest. It's a complete mess in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon. Just name, all, name these countries and who has made this, this, this mess. It's all these allied forces. And if you divide this, like, so the, you have a situation like there is this terrorist activity going on. And if you just divide it in, in, in two phases, like one is the process to deal with it and the other one is the result. And uh, so one process, there are two kinds of process. One is the Western and the US forces that they have used in all these countries. They went there, they bombed all of th those people. A lots of, in, like so many innocent people died and there was all that collateral damage. And that resulted in more terrorism because, for example, if my brother dies because of a U.S. operation, what I would do, I would just go and bomb the U.S. forces. That's what I would do. That's what collateral damage is. When any innocent dies in those bombings, in those operations, their family members, they think that they just don't want to do anything. That's what happened. So that was the process used by those forces. And here is one process used by Chinese in Xinjiang. It was the same issue. There was terrorism, there were bombings, there were terrorist attacks. No bombings, no army, no, army, no jet planes, no operations, nothing. There's no genocide. No one died in, in Xinjiang. But just look what they did, what a mess they created. And then you talk about the result. Two results are very clear. One result is Xinjiang. And one result is all this Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, all these countries that I just mentioned, they wanted to counter this terrorism. And what they left behind is the same ISS, the same these, these groups, 
and what they are doing, it's all again the mess. And here in Xinjiang, we have this BRI projects, we have development going on, we have peace and stability. The standard of living is up, is high. Local people are happy. What, what you mm -hmm. has achieved from Afghanistan after 20 years. And you are not the first Muslims that I talked to that have these concerns or scared before going to Xinjiang because well, what you guys been reading from the internet, from the major media outlets. Um, so like even you guys had this concern, was scared because you are kind of thinking there were actually uh, oppressions or genocide towards Muslims. So maybe that's, I think that's what they're trying to do, create this kind of distrust between Muslims countries, uh, between the China's friends, all those Muslim countries who are China's allies and friends. Um, even like you, uh, we're Batia still have these concerns. So that's how powerful their propaganda skill is to create this distrust among those friend, uh, friends, friendly countries. As a Muslim yourself, do you trust the care coming from these several major Western governments? <laughs> why would I? Why would I trust? They cared about Afghanistan. They cared about Iraq. But what I know is that they only cared about the oil in Iraq or all the resources in Iraq. Iraq is a mess, but only the areas where oil is located, it's not a mess. It's all good over there, but all over Iraq, it's a mess. Saudi, it's all peace because they are very good with the US. They have very good connection, but Iran is bad because they are not good with US. Same in Yemen, same in Lebanon, same in Syria. What's going on? That, 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 that's all what they want. They just care about their benefits. They, why would they care about the locals in Afghanistan or in all those countries? They just don't care. They have nothing to do with them. They just care about their own benefits. They just care about themselves. They stayed there for, for all this period. They did what they wanted. They gained what they wanted. They just left a mess behind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harood. Thank you for joining Thank my you. show. I Thank hope you to have you more on my show. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for having me. <laughs>